Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Carmine. Uh, some of you may have seen me lingering around the OR. Believe it or not, I'm the director of orthopedic and spine here. Um, I wanted to give you guys a presentation, kind of what to expect when the Joint Commission comes, because we're going to be getting a certification for hips and knees for the hospital. It's very specific. It's not knees in general. It's elective knee replacements which are total and unis, as well as elective hip replacements. So no hip fractures, no knee arthroscopies, no nothing else. It's just replacements. But again, the knee replacements are unis and totals, and the hips are just total hips. They could be anterior, posteriors, but they need to be elective procedures. So hip fractures that end up having a total hip don't count. So it has to be an elective procedure. So this is uh, certified by the Joint Commission, and you know uh, the benefits of having this certification, it really provides us with the framework to be an advanced program. Uh, I already feel we are an advanced program, believe it or not. I really feel we are so far uh, past the other local hospitals um, that I've seen and, and, and been to. Um, and, and we want to demonstrate to the community that we provide the uh, highest quality service when it comes to uh, joint replacements. Also for the hospital, it is an excellent marketing tool and possible uh, increase for reimbursements for the hospital as well as the surgeons for the future. But establishing a standard of care and consistency, you know, like this, this second bullet point states, uh, it reduces variation and risk of error. So we're really trying to get most of the surgeons to converge and do very similar things. So you know every guy has their own MO. Every guy likes to do something different. We can't really tell the surgeons what they should or should not do, but we want to get them as close as possible to uh, a similar standard of care. Because again, if everybody's doing a similar thing, at least very, very close, there's much less chance of error. Because you guys know, you're in a room, you maybe never been in there before, you never worked with one of the surgeons, you don't really know what they like if you're not part of their team on a consistent basis. So that's also what the Joint Commission wants to see. They want to see that the whole continuum of care, that there is a similar standard of care. There's consistency from not only the pre-op standpoint, intra-op, similar teams being in similar surgeons' rooms, which I know a lot of the times there are teams that are consistent in the rooms. They want to see all that, even to the post-op follow-ups. So again, you know, this is providing the framework. This is a duplicate slide, I think. Okay. Um, so you know, what's our overall performance improvement plan? This is an overall plan. What do we want to be? We want to be the best. We want to be known in, in the Hudson Valley region as the place to go for hip and knee replacements. Period. End of story. In terms of specific performance improvement plans, we want to improve all of our numbers. We want to decrease our length of stay. We want to increase our patient satisfaction. Um, we have specific metrics that we're measuring, such as our attendance at our, our preoperative joint class, um, our, how many patients are going through ERAS. We want to increase all of those percentages because it's a trickle-down effect. If, if one thing starts to work and it starts to click, everything starts to fall into place, decrease length of stay, increase patient satisfaction, patients have less pain, they're up earlier, their recovery is better, everything falls into place. So our overall improve, uh, performance improvement plan, we basically, again, you're going to hear a lot of repetition about standardizing things. So we want to standardize all of our practices. So by doing this, what, what I did was I standardized all the order sets. So the surgeons really have to stick by the order sets more or less. Again, I can't tell a surgeon what they should or should not do. They can still go outside of order sets and order things like a CPM machine for physical therapy. But we, again, really want people to do a similar thing. We want strict quality assurance. Everything that we do should be um, clinically researched. There should be evidence-based medicine behind it. So we take an interdisciplinary team approach. We want everybody involved and knowing the continuum of care. So of course you guys know what goes on in the OR, kind of pre-op, intra-op, in, in PACU. 
the deal goes that the Joint Commission wants to come and they're not going to ask you the stuff that they know that you know. They want to ask you the stuff that they think you don't know. So they'll say something like, well, when the patient goes to the floor, what happens? So you guys say, why do I have to know that stuff? They want you to know that stuff. They want everybody to be involved in the whole continuum of care. What is the patient's goals? What, uh, what are they coming in for? What happens on the floor? What happens for discharge? So you know, I'm going to create a booklet that is going to be in PACU, ASC, that you guys can go through. It's going to have a ton of information, and it will go through the whole process of what happens preoperatively, uh, intraoperatively, uh, postoperatively, discharge, so on and so forth. I don't expect them to really hit you guys super hard with things like discharge and so on and so forth. But again, they're not going to ask the most common question you think they're going to ask. For example, one of the questions, they're going to go into ASC and they're going to ask one of the nurses, why are you guys swabbing people's noses? <clears throat> you guys do, you know, and they, they do this every single day, but sometimes we don't really know why we're doing it. We don't know why we do some of the things that we do. That's what they want to know. They want to know you know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Everybody knows the surgeons. Everybody knows who does what. Um, so that's pretty easy. Um, education is one of the most important things. They want to know how you guys are getting educated. So of course there's all kinds of I learn things that you have to go through. Um, there's in-house disciplinary meetings. You guys have meetings. What is it? How many Thursdays do you guys have meetings? <coughs> Every, Thursday. Every Thursday you guys have meetings. That's educational. Um, I know there's I learn. We have specific orthopedic and spine meetings. We have interdisciplinary <coughs> meetings. Um, I'm part of a, a JPAR, which is a whole Northwell subcommittee with all the Northwell hospitals. And we go over all of these clinical practice guidelines, all of the research, all of the evidence-based medicine, and all of the recommendations of why we do what we do. And again, those orthopedic guideline folders, I'm in the middle of creating them, they'll have information from even, even evidence-based research in there of why we do, for example, ERAS, or why we do transisemic acid during hip and knee replacements. So those are the things that they may want to know from you guys. So what are the clinical practice guidelines? They're basically recommendations for the clinicians. And this is part of me being on this JPAR committee. We go over all of these recommendations. They're recommendations. It doesn't mean that we have to adopt them. It doesn't mean we have to do them. But they are evidence-based and they are best practice. So clinical practice guidelines, they're reflected in everything we do every day. So for example, when they're in ASC or, you know, and they're getting a, an adductor canal block or they're getting antibiotics one to two hours before their hip replacement, those are clinical practice guidelines. They're seen in the booking sheets. So when the surgeons book their patient for surgery, their, their surgical coordinators check off all of these things. We know already that they're going to do uh, a an, uh, periarticular injection with rapivacaine, clonidine, toradol. We already know that they chose to do vancomycin and, and, uh, and kefzol. We already know uh, that they want either topical transisemic acid or IV transisemic acid. That's what clinical practice guidelines are. They're in the booking sheets. They're in the order sets. So the post-operative order sets, those are our clinical practice guidelines. There's evidence-based behind all of that stuff. It's not like coming out of thin air and, hey, we're going to do this because we want to do this. And again, it's, they're all updated. They're all, all uh, evidence-based. And they need to be, we can't just adopt them. They need to be presented, reviewed, and approved by kind of everyone in the whole committee. So this is an example of the booking sheet. So these are part of our clinical practice guidelines. You, you guys, I don't know who gets to see this in... Uh, in ASC. Who sees it? The physician. Is that the physician order? Oh, it's in the, the order. Yeah. Anybody, it's in the chart. Anybody can see that. So, anybody, so that goes in the chart. And yeah. it's also yeah. in Meditech. You can okay. also see it in Meditech. So, for example, this is clinical practice guidelines. So you can see over here, this is what they check. You know, you got Kepsol, you got vancomycin. That's the order. Start one to two hours prior to incision. You can see the ERAS orders over here, which Actually, I just updated, we took protonics off of this order set. So there's no, it's not needed. It's not a needed thing. But we have 
part of the ERAS, you know, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, gabapentin, something for no, you know, nausea. You can see the other side, that's the ERAS. This is transacetic acid, and periarticular injection is also on this as well. We took off Expirel, so there'll be no more Expirel used in orthopedics. I think they're taking it away in general, but no more Expirel. It's just going to be Repivacaine injection. That's it. So everyone is on the same page. I know Dr. Hawkins was kind of still using Expirel on and off. No more. It's, it, that's done. So it's just going to be the Repivacaine injection. It's off of this. They can't even order it. So just so you guys know that. So we had, we had to choose key performance measures. They could have been anything. They could have been average length of stay. They could have been infection rate. We chose, we had to choose four measures. So these are the measures that we chose. We used the usage of ERAS, 30-day readmission rate, monthly discharge home rate, and preoperative joint class. Again, this is a whole trickle-down effect. Everything affects one another. It all starts in the preoperative joint class. So we're monitoring our attendance, and a part of our, our performance improvement plan is how are we going to increase the amount of people coming to this preoperative joint class. So again, we've done things like uh, send flyers out, um, follow up phone calls, hey, you have an appointment, emails, so on and so forth. Um, you know, the usage of ERAS. We were actually doing 0% ERAS for our uni compartmental knees. Now we are actually at 100% in the last two months. Our total, our total knees are pretty much, we're okay. We're up, we're up there, 88%, but, but we went up 15%, and our average for hips, we're, almost, we're 96%, so we're doing very well. And I'll talk more about egress later and why that's important to the whole program. So again, you know, if we can get patients uh, a consistent care, uh, less pain, mobilize them earlier, everything falls into place. All of our numbers get better and better, so if we increase the usage of egress, decrease the amount of pain, mobilize them earlier, there's less amounts of complications, there's less 30-day rate readmission rate, our monthly discharge home rate increases, less people have to go to rehab, so again, it's that whole trickle-down effect. Everything affects one another. So these are the measures that the Joint Commission is going to be looking at. I don't think you guys are going to have to talk about data and talk about this specific stuff. They want to ask you guys more about what is done in the, in the whole perioperative kind of realm. <clears throat> They're not really going to ask. This is, this is for me to kind of get knocked over the head with, not you guys. But again, they might want to know, you know some information like, hey, what measures are being you know, kind of measured here? So obviously, this is on here. This is general information. You know, why, why do you do hip and knee replacements? 99.9% .9 of the time, it's obviously because of osteoarthritis. It's because whether it's just genetically predisposed, whether it's post-traumatic arthritis, that's why you do those things. You guys know all of that stuff. You know what a hip replacement is, a total hip replacement, replacing the ball in the socket. It's not a hemiarthroplasty where you just replace the stem, but of course you're replacing the ball and socket over here. We do pretty much two approaches here. Now with Hawkins here, we do a direct anterior approach. And of course, most of the other guys just do a simple posterior approach. When Grossman was here, we had a few other approaches, but I haven't really seen anybody since Grossman do like an anterior lateral or a direct lateral approach. And you know knee replacement, total knee replacement, replacing the whole distal femur, proximal tibia, and a, and a unique compartmental knee is just replacing a single area of arthritis. So that can be medial, that can be lateral, or that can simply just be the patellofemoral component. So, you know, what do we do for patients? Because this is another thing that they want you guys to know. They want to know, do you know how we're educating patients? You guys are educating patients in ASC, in PACU, and sometimes you don't even realize that it's part of your MO and you guys are doing that. You know, what do we do preoperatively? Of course, we have our total joint class, which we, we spoke about before. We go through the whole continuum of care in our joint class discussing what their goals are, what they are to expect literally when they walk in the door to what they are to expect in ASC intraoperatively, postoperatively on the floor, as well as discharge. We answer all their questions. Um, you know, I've even done over the phone joint classes because people can't make it. And again, this is very important because 
many patients come in and they still have no idea what's going on or what the procedure is. They, uh, you know, they really need to be prepared. It's, it's, I think it's very important for them to understand, hey, you're going to get up the same day of surgery. You're going to start moving. You're probably going to leave the next day of surgery. Having that in their head early <laughs> is very important to an earlier discharge home rate, more motivation to get them up sooner and, and a quicker recovery. So um, obviously we have more information sessions for the patients, Kabi, Karis, Yasmin, they do all my aching knees. Th that's something that people have not even been seen yet. That's just general public that I have knee pain and I want to kind of learn what goes on. That's, that's more of, um, that, you know, let them know, hey, we're here for you. We can diagnose your problem. Come into the office. Come see us. We want to talk to them about different options, whether it's be a simple knee arthroscopy, which, again, we're not focusing on, to even a knee replacement, uh, so on and so forth. I think we're actually starting to implement all my aching shoulders as well. Um, but this should, this is, uh, again, it includes uh, interdisciplinary, anesthesiologist, surgeon, physical therapist, so on and so forth. So uh, preoperative patient care, what do we tell patients? You guys know this stuff. Stop smoking, drinking alcohol, um, have a better diet. We also talk to them about prehab. Prehab is basically going to, rehabil going to physical therapy before you even have surgery. You know, optimizing your physical condition so post-operatively, again, I know it's beating you over the head with this, you optimize their conditions so they are able to get up sooner, move quicker, have a quicker recovery. That's the whole point of the whole thing. So that all leads to increased patient satisfaction. Um, ERAS we'll talk about in a little bit. Of course, we tell them to use HibaCleanse Hib Wash at least one night before surgery. Again, improved diet, smoking, no smoking. So what, it, what is ERAS? We use it. Does anybody know exactly what it is? <coughs> Besides Bill? <laughs> Early recovery after surgery. Do you know why though? Do you know the, do you know the mechanism? Do you know why it's early re uh, enhanced recovery after it's enhanced less narcotics? But why? To get the patient. What's the mechanism? So so this is this is the mundane stuff that we do every day, but we don't actually know why does ERAS work? What, why? Why do they use less narcotics? Why does this happen? Why are they able to get up earlier? That's what the Joint Commission wants to know that you guys know. I know, it's, you know, it's tough. But ERAS, so this is, this is maintained through the whole procedure. This starts actually preoperatively. So what is the point of ERAS? The point of ERAS is to reduce the stress response on your system postoperatively. So what happens is you carbohydrate load the patient. You also want them to have a diet high in protein before surgery. What happens is you have a high stress response. If you have a high stress response postoperatively, you have more inflammation. If you have more inflammation, what happens? More pain. You have more pain. You have more pain, you're taking more narcotics. You take more narcotics, you're constipated, nausea, you're vomiting, you're dizzy, you don't get up out of bed postoperative day zero, you're here an extra day, you lose a whole day, game over. Our length of stay increased, you know, uh, patient's unhappy, there you go. But by having carbo loading, carbohydrate loading the patient, having a diet high in protein before the surgery, what it does is it, may, it, it allows your body to eat up the carbohydrates instead of eating up the protein. It allows you to maintain your muscle, because you lose muscle mass very quick. It, it allows you to maintain your protein levels and your muscle mass, which reduces the stress response. So you reduce inflammation. The patients don't need as much pain, pain medication. They're up, they're about, they're happy, they're out of here the next day, and they're doing great. So again, that trickle-down effect, decreased length, length of stay, early ambulation, and multimodal an analgesia. So part of ERAS is this multimodal analgesia, which is not just taking Percocets and taking all these IV dilaudids and all that stuff. It also has to do with the adductor canal block the periarticular injection that's done during surgery. All of that stuff is decreasing the amount of narcotic use because that periarticular injection, that adductor canal block, it's great because the adductor canal block, uh, back in the day you do the femoral nerve block, 
put them in an immobilizer, they couldn't walk for 24 hours, sometimes longer. Now with adductor canal block, it allows you to maintain motor function. It's just, it's just dulling the pain sensory part of the femoral nerve of the adductor canal. So they're allowed, they can get up right away once the spinal wears off. And that's why they're doing more shorter acting spinals these days. So again, trickle down effect. So obviously, we, this is one of the questions that, that you know, I kept focusing on because I, I wasn't even sure in the You know you do iodine-based nasal swabs in ASC because you're reducing surgical site infection. But, but it, you know, I wasn't really sure, you know, wh where did this come from? But it ended up it was adopted and it's a standing order for all ortho, I think all, is it all cases now? Ortho and GYN right now. Ortho and GYN, but all ortho cases, it's a standing order. So that might be a question that the Joint Commission would want to, well, what'd you do that for? You know, and, and, and why? Because it's a standing order. Standing order and policy to reduce infection. End of story. So obviously we spoke about clinical practice guidelines. That's on the booking sheet, the capsules, the vancos. I'll have that all printed out in a binder for you guys. And, and again, if you don't know the answer, what is your answer? What I is your answer to the Joint Commission? I can you... find out. Exactly. I, I'm going to ask my manager. If your manager doesn't know, oh, here's the book. Here's the book. All right, let me go in the book. Take 20 minutes in the book if you got to go. As long as you get the answer. That's, that's the answer. Is you go in the book or you ask your manager or you ask one of your colleagues. That's it. So, um, again, a lot of repetition. Uh, you guys are probably want to kill me by now. So, given <laughs> multimodal medications, these are the medications for ERAS that we have chosen. Uh, different institutions use slightly different medications, but it really revolves around preoperative pre, pre optimization. So, the, you get the anti-inflammatory effects, the um, nerve calming agent, and um, and you get the anti-nausea medication. Some places don't use a patch. They'll they'll give um, different types of medications for anti-nausea, and some some places also will add a narcotic in there. Which again, I, I still don't understand the reason of adding the narcotic in there when ERAS is to you know decrease the amount of narcotic use. But a lot of a lot of places are doing it, but I haven't seen much in the study. So. So again, a ductal canal block, you know that that's the block. That is the block for all joint replacements. It's a ductal canal block and a spinal. Unless deemed otherwise, maybe a patient needs general, or even if they're getting general, they're getting an adductor canal block also for post-operative pain control. So again, they want to know that type of stuff. Transisemic acid, IV, or locally, that is part of our clinical practice guidelines. Does anybody know? They might ask you, why do you use transesthetic acid? Does anybody know why you use transesthetic acid? No? Transesthetic acid is an anti-fibrolytic lytic agent. So what it does is it reduces the breakdown of blood clots. Okay? So it reduces the amount of bleeding. So again, not only during surgery, but I've also given this after surgery when patients' hemoglobin has dropped. Um, and if you think it's dropped significantly enough, I've even given a gram of this after surgery through the IV to reduce the amount of bleeding that happens in a knee or a hip, so on and so forth, if I think that they're actively still bleeding. Um, but again, uh, some guys, uh, there's no studies that show IV versus placing it locally that one is better than the other. Um, so... We spoke about periarticular injection, Exparel is gone. This is the cocktail that the pharmacy mixes for you guys, and that's what's injected through uh, the different syringes. That's done locally through the subcutaneous tissue, the tendons, all over the knee it can be injected, especially posteriorly. One potential side effect of this is patients can come to the floor with a foot drop. So obviously there's, you know, they bring in a SWAT team. When there's a foot drop, they call me, they, they're, they're calling me from wherever I am, foot drop, foot drop. So that's why education is important. When a patient has a foot drop, either it could be a true post-operative complication as in a nerve injury, or it could just be a side effect of being injected posteriorly throughout the knee. So knowing that, even in PACU, is a very important thing. Hey, patient had the injection, there's a foot drop, 
what do we do? So, you, you know, if you do see a foot drop, you got to notice it. you got to escalate it to the surgeon, or you can call me to come take a look at it. Most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, it is part of this periarticular injection. And by the nighttime or the next morning, it's worn off. They're perfect. They're 100%. So, but there are true foot drops from peroneal nerve injuries where you have to, you know, there's different treatments that you have to go through. You have to flex the knee up, you have to unwrap all the ACE bandages or whatever the surgeon has on there. So, so it's important, it's not important for you guys to necessarily know the treatment, it's important for anyone to notice it. You have to identify it so that you can escalate it. So again, you know, that's one of the complications that you can have from the periarticular injection. You guys know this stuff. <laughs> I'm not going to go over it. So, so basically on the floor, posterior hips, get hip precautions. What are hip precautions? So for the first, usually about three months after surgery before everything scars in, you can't cross your legs. for a, This is for a posterior hip. Posterior hip only. You can't cross your legs. You can't sit in chairs that make your leg go more than 90 degrees. No internal rotation because that can cause dislocation of the hip. Remember, with uh, anterior, now that we're doing anterior hips again, there's no hip precautions because it's muscle sparing procedure. It's intermuscular, internervous. You're going in between. You're not cutting through. So their muscle tension is holding the hip into place. Can they still dislocate? Absolutely. But there's a minimal chance of them to dislocate. So again, they want you to know even stuff on the floor and little things like this where they might ask, well, why'd you put a hip abduction pillow on the patient? Well, because they have hip precautions and we don't want them to dislocate. That's the answer. When they go home, they usually sleep with a pillow in between their legs. And, or you have somebody like Styles, he does a hip, he'll put a knee immobilizer on the patient. It works the same as the hip adductor pillow. If you can't bend your knee, you can't dislocate your hip. It, it can't happen. So it works as the same function. So joint commission comes in, they come in to pack you. This is a hip replacement. Why did you, you put a knee immobilizer on the patient so it can't dislocate? So that, you know, those are, those are the, they don't want to ask you the stuff you know. They want to ask you the stuff they think you don't know. So that's where they get you. We still use CPM machines for knees. That's continuous passive motion. Only Yasger and Yormac use those machines. We're trying to get rid of them. There is no evidence that shows that they work. The evidence actually shows it increases length of stay and it increases uh, the amount of money as well. We get every patient up unless any complications the same day of surgery with physical therapy. Unless they get up to the floor too late, um, unless they have a foot drop or something like that, we always try to get patients up. They'll get one more dose of antibiotics on the floor after surgery, either eight, eight or 12 hours later, depending, some guys like vancomycin again, some guys like another dose of Kefsol. And anticoagulation, that's another huge thing. 99% of the guys are using aspirin. They use adult aspirin twice a day, unless there's any predisposing factors. They'll put the patient on Coumadin, Xarelto, Eliquis. If a patient obviously comes in on anticoagulation, they usually go back on the same anticoagulation, but not at least until 24 to 48 hours later. So on the floor, again, I know you guys are like, why do I have to know what happens on the floor? But it's re repetition. They want to know the whole, you know, the whole continuum of care, you, you know, repositioning the patient, monitoring dressing for bleeding, again with the foot drop, incentive spirometer is very important uh, when I've uh, talked to other facilities that had the certification, for some reason they really pumped incentive spirometer into everybody's head. So, you know, it's if they ask you, just, yep, yeah, incentive spirometer, we go nuts. Does the patient do it? No, I go in the room 50 times a day, I go, use the incentive spirometer. I am, they're not really. <laughs> so, so they don't really use it. The nurses on the floor, I know for a fact, they, they tell them all the time, use incentive spirometer. Yeah, they use it after you tell them for the three minutes, and then, and then they don't use it for the rest of the day. So it is very important to prevent atelectasis. And of course, we monitor the vital signs, and you know they escalate as per usual to usually me. So discharge plan. Again, I know you guys are like, why do I got to know the discharge plan? But 
you know, just from the beginning, they want to know that everyone knows the patient's goal. And I'm not, our goal, so a lot of people misinterpret, our goal for the patient is what? Is, is mobilize them early, reduce their pain, reduce nausea, vomiting, get them up and about, increase their satisfaction, get them out of here early, have a great recovery. But their expectation and goal is, I want to get to my daughter's wedding in three months. It's different. So, so they want to know, not only do we know the goal, uh, our goal, our goal, you guys know what our goal is, we have no infection, patient does great, they go home, they're excellent. But what's the patient's goal? So that's going to start to be being implemented even in ASC, that there'll be a patient goal card that you, you're just going to add, and it's going to go in their chart with them to every time they get, when they go to pack you, when they go to the floor, when they're going to be discharged. So that's something that's going to be implemented in the near future that we know what the patient's, and, and listen, the patient's goal can change literally from the, the day that they start here to the day that they leave here where they you know where they're like oh well i have a different goal now so we want to know what the patient's goal is joint commission loves that they eat that up they love that stuff and they want to know that uh, that we are patient centered which is a good thing and we should be um typically we discharge most patients home most patients home, whether it be with or without services, meaning the VNA goes to the house, they have home physical therapy, and most patients are leaving post-operative day one or two. So most uni compartmental knees, they leave the next day. Most total hips are leaving the next day. Um, total knees, you know, again, they usually are here for about two days or so. So if they have surgery Tuesday, they're usually leaving Thursday. The only way that we're sending people to rehab is, is if they have a social situation where they live alone, they have a lot of stairs, they're deemed unsafe to go home. Um, but again, we want to send most people home. So what are the complications? This was another thing that they kind of were attacking at all different hospitals. Complication, you can, you can dislocate your hip, you can dislocate your knee, for those of you that don't know. And, I, and it's not a good injury. Um, you can have periprosthetic fracture. You have a, a knee replacement, hip replacement, you fall here, you fall outside the hospital, you can break around the prosthesis. You guys have seen those surgeries where there's fracture on the prosthesis and we're putting plates and cables and the whole nine yards. Infection, that's one of the biggest things. That's the biggest reason for patients to come back, is infection, surgical site infection. Neurovascular injury, foot drops, compartment syndromes. Another biggest, uh, the other biggest reason for them to come back is the DVT. So uh, knee, knees are the highest rate of DVT in, in any post-operative procedures. So it's very important that the patient mobilize themselves, get going, take their anticoagulation. That's another reason you get patients up early, to reduce the amount of DVT. And of course, atelectasis and pneumonia. So that, that's pretty much kind of the continuum of care. I don't expect you guys to know every little thing. That's why I'm going to be preparing these binders. There's going to be a lot of information in it. There's actually going to be the handouts that we give the patients uh, after joint class for hips and knees. Every little thing is going to be in there. I don't expect you to memorize it, but you should have a good idea of the continuum of care for what we do preoperatively to even all the way to discharge. So that's pretty much the idea of what they're looking for. So they don't want to just know what you guys do in the operating room. They want to know kind of everything. Do you guys have any questions? That was super informative. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. That's it. No questions. Let me off that easy. <laughs>